Once upon a time in Hollywood, some things were taboo to criticize, like, for example, the Catholic Church. Well, times and movies have changed. Larry King is a media star now, but he used to live in Miami, and he recalls those days that led to downfall, bankruptcy, and near professional ruin, and taking it to the streets. Hot dogs and more, that is. This is Montage. Hello, I'm Joe Abril in the beautiful Blessed Sacrament Chapel of St. Mary's Cathedral. Time was in this country, it seems a long time now, when some institutions were above public scrutiny. A man's politics and his religion and his faith and his church were almost beyond discussion. Well, we know what's happened to politics, particularly since Watergate, but now it seems religion and the church are not far behind. Here's Nancy Ross. Being Catholic used to come with rigid, sometimes mysterious rules. Latin mass, meatless Fridays, sex to make babies, and above all, no challenges to the Vatican, the spiritual government of Catholics worldwide. It's true that many of these rules are now history, and last week a movie opened that challenges one of the best kept of all Roman Catholic mysteries, the Vatican purse strings. Monsignor stars Christopher Reeve as Father Flaherty, a young priest taken under the wing of Pope Pius and his right-hand cardinal. Flaherty is a financial whiz kid with a plan to make money for the church, which according to the movie makers, went bankrupt after World War II. Eminence, the black market is everywhere. We can't stop it. I am merely suggesting that we divert money from crime and give it to the church. Flaherty gets the Vatican's blessing and an alter ego. He becomes Lieutenant Finnegan, a brash army officer who sells Vatican commissary supplies, like cigarettes, to the Mafia, the group then running a Roman black market. He comes to the Vatican after the war, sees that the Mafia is profiteering off the um, war surplus business, and why not take it from the Mafia and put it into the church where it'll be used for good and not for evil? I recently asked Christopher Reeve about the morality and realism of his father Flaherty role. This ends justifies the means is a rational argument. In fact, this behavior is modeled on some real people whose names I don't need to mention. Um, but this is actually how the Vatican organ reorganized their finances after the war. The movie is fiction, but not all fiction. Just months ago, this startling book, The Vatican Connection, released information of shady financing schemes involving the Vatican and the Mafia. For the first time in history, the ledgers of the Holy See will be open to an outside panel. The movie's father, Flaherty, is patterned after real-life American Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, president of the Vatican Bank and confidant of Pope John Paul. With churchgoers and men entering the priesthood both on the wane, how do books and movies that badmouth the Vatican affect faith of Catholics locally? I, I found the movie almost uh, unbelievable and lacking credibility in every way. Father Robert Lynch is director of St. John Vianney Seminary here in Miami, a training ground for the priesthood. Father Lynch also has Vatican exposure. He arranged security for Pope John Paul's trip to the United States, working with none other than Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. It's classic more, uh, Roman Catholic moral theology that the ends never justify the means. No one could come out of that movie feeling, I don't think, that the ends that were used, just, or the, that the end that was arrived at justified the sleazy means that were used to get there. But sleazy is hardly Reeves' description. He sees Flaherty's choices as spirituality versus flesh and blood. It can harm Father Flaherty, never the church. While the movie takes place in the church, it's really about a man trying to reconcile the difference between being a passionate, intelligent, and fully, you know, f um, fully alive human being and being a religious man, which, which demands that you stop a lot of those instincts. Well, I think I'm passionate, I think I'm intelligent, and I hope to God I'm fully alive. I don't think I gave up any of those things. I may have given up sexual intimacy with a woman by becoming a priest, but that doesn't make me less passionate in a sense. And speaking of sexual intimacy, Father Flaherty doesn't miss that chance either. In the great Hollywood tradition, he also gets the girl. She's a wayward nun to be. It's a fantasy that does focus on the real issue of 20th century celibacy. The moral of Monsignor is 
faith will be tested. Frankie Blond's producer of Monsignor, took on the Italian community after another of his productions, The Godfather. He feels this film won't raise a single Catholic eyebrow. Why do you say that this will probably be well received by the, by the Vatican and by members of the church? Because I think that they are an enlightened group of people. I think these are issues that are, that are real. Priests want to marry. Priests want to leave the church. These are issues that the Vatican has to deal with. Uh, and uh, there are moral choices that have to be made by people who decide to, uh, to don the cloth. I can assure you that the Vatican will not receive this movie well, that there is no one there who will like it. Do you think that's the way the church really operates? Or do you think most Catholics believe that's the way the church operates? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. In fact, I'm positive it's not the way the, the church operates. Uh, I think every parish institution does its very best, every church institution does its best to explain its financial situation. And if it's in dire straits, it brings the people together to help, uh, to help plan together how to get out of those straits. Father Lynch thinks the Vatican could help its image by tearing down the veil of secrecy that shrouds its finances. But this latest black eye for the church doesn't seem to concern the faithful locally. If the Vatican and Mafia are banking together, or if Hollywood just says they are, doesn't affect the local parishes, where high finance still means bingo and the weekly collection basket. Larry King. Most of America knows Larry King as an all-night radio talk show host who interviews celebrities on the Mutual Radio Network from Washington, D.C. But in South Florida, the name Larry King brings back other memories for some people. He was once a very successful radio and television talk show host here who fell from grace in a jumble of nearly $300,000 in bad debts and finally criminal charges that he stole $5,000 from Jacksonville financier Louis Wolfson. Well, that was in 1971. He left Miami in disgrace. Since then, of course, Larry has come back bigger than ever and has written a book that recalls some of his nearly 20 years in South Florida. So when he was here recently, I first of all wanted to find out why, even when it seemed nearly everyone in town knew Larry couldn't handle money, he always seemed to be able to get a loan from some bank. Larry, I asked, how did you do it? Well, you know, it's funny because I do describe it in the book, and I guess lots of people who've watching this and barred from Peter to pay Paul have either done it or done measures of it. Yeah. Uh, and as I do it now, this is sort of a looking back. It's weird to talk about sometimes about the book because it's so past tense in my life. My life has changed so much since it. I don't handle my funds. Bob Wolf handles all my funds. Yeah. Uh, I get an allowance. Everything that is paid out of Boston. However, what I would do is I would not book the bank president on the show in order to get a loan. He would be booked. I never use the show as an influence. So the okay. bank president's on the show, and I've done the show, and now it's three weeks later, and I'm tight. And I was always tight in this town. You I always, money. Owed, always owed somebody. So I'd call him up and tell him how wonderful he was on the show. Now, by that time, it's been three weeks. The show is popular. A lot of people have told him they heard him. So he has become a mini star, mm. right? He's known in town. And I would go by or call and say, I'm having this little problem. You know, could you help me? You were so terrific on my show and this kind of thing. And a loan would be uh, completed without benefit of going through the loan department. Uh -huh. It would be a... Now, I would bet on scales that could probably still happen today. I haven't done it in a long time. But we're a business of human beings. We're people of human beings, and sure. people react differently. And people, a lot of people took to me well. But, Larry, did, when, you, when you got the $5,000, did you say to yourself, ha-ha, sucker, I'm never going to pay this back? Oh, no, no, because many of them were paid. You couldn't exist. If I just is, existed accumulating debts, then you can't, uh, you'd run out in a year. Yeah. What you have to do when you're in that kind of state, and I try to describe it, is you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Oh, you pay Paul. Now, what happens is there becomes four Peters yeah. and seven Pauls, so two Pauls get paid. Then it become nine Peters and six Pauls, and five Peters get paid. Yeah. And eventually, you can't bounce the balls anymore. What I'm amazed in looking back at myself was how I was able to function otherwise. For example, I never let it affect my work on the air. I never went on the air and uh, did a bad show. I never let it bother me. If I, you know, I've had times where I've gone to do a radio show or a television show when they were repossessing furniture. Really? And I had to come into a station, 
and sit there and do a Jackie Gleason or someone sit here at Channel 4 and do someone while that was happening. And I was always able to divorce the two. And I think that the little kid from Brooklyn never believed that the person on the air could be the same person as him. I think I always had doubts about self, and that's been the most effective change I've had. Well, so I don't that, worry about that. How did that change come about? You were down and out and... and uh, that was the key. Used figuratively down you know, and out. No, figuratively, literally. Couldn't get a job. That was the key. I was out of work. I was here in uh, Miami. I left Miami. I went to Shreveport, Louisiana. I worked at a racetrack. Came back. Got a part-time job in California. But the important part is the down and out part. The best thing that ever happened to me was being shot down. If I had continued on that pendulum, even if I earn more money, you never earn enough. If it had happened to me when I was 50 instead of 39, mm -hmm. you're in tough shape at 50. So I was lucky enough, this is in retrospect, I didn't look at it that day and say, boy, am I lucky. Yeah, of course. To be knocked down. And once you're knocked down, first, there's two decisions you have to make. There's no way to go but up. Or you get, I never had depression as I would classify depression. I never felt suicidal. I never felt out of it. I always felt inside of me somewhere I'd come back. And what I told myself was if I came back, you know, I sure was going to make the attempt not to let that happen again. And I build up guards on myself that eventually led to doing what I should have done when I was 35, and that is have someone take over my life. In other words... Well, what is with you and money? Why can't you... What's... what's the, you still have the problem with money? I don't know. Because you don't have any to test yeah, it. Are you I, uh, afraid to test it? I'll tell you what, you know, that was asked to me something. And I said, so what if I'm afraid to test it? By the way, I, I, I earn pretty good income. My daughter's in a private school and I'm raising her. I live in a nice place. I live in a wonderful city. The show's been successful. I've got a book out, starting a new television show. Okay, all these things have happened. Bob Wolf is one of the most prestigious, nicest, capable men in America. Right. He was the first agent ever to represent athletes. Me and 600 other people send him their paychecks. Kalia Stremsky's been doing it for 20 years. I asked Kalia Stremsky, can't you hand your own money? And he said to me, who cares? Okay, the answer is I don't know, and I don't test myself. Why should I test myself? The money goes to Bob Wolf. He disperses, he negotiates contracts, yeah. and I live off an allowance. Now... He pays your bills? Everything. Light bills? Water I don't have any water. income. I get an allowance from him. A check comes from him. Okay. So I put a guard on myself. It's like saying, suppose an alcoholic were here, Same and you thing. say to the alcoholic, can't go in a bar and drink? Yeah, Why should he right. go in a bar and drink? Okay, well, that's great that you moved through that, but as you enumerate how successful you are and how everything's going well, I can imagine that people who are watching who, who you left owing money and still do are, are really irritated right now, looking at uh, you very glib and self-satisfied, and yet I have it in my pocket. I'm not going to bring it out because I don't want to dwell in the past too much, but you owe a lot of people a lot of money. Little no, people. I don't. Not big banks, but little No, I don't know anybody. No? Any money. Uh, we have a law in this country. It's a very important law, and there was a reason for it, and it's bankruptcy law. Right. It's in the first article of the Constitution. And I asked my bankruptcy lawyer in Washington, why is it in the first article of the Constitution? He said, because that was the most important aspect, that people would have a chance to start again. That's all it is. You right. pay a price for it. You don't get credit. But it legally gives you the opportunity to bounce back. Now... We have today, I don't know how, how many bankruptcies were declared in Miami yesterday? A lot, a lot. A lot. All Increase. those people. Why don't we bring them all in here and let everybody watch them and scoff at them? Or do we say, give them another chance? Uh, You've rehearsed this, it was, this routine. No, I'm not. I didn't, in fact, so nobody's ever asked it of me. Really? The reason nobody's asked it of me, in fact, someone said to me, why go down to Miami? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry it happened. I wish it didn't happen, but it happened. Now, what do I do? Do I crawl along the street? Do I live in grief? Or do I face it? I really am sorry. Well, Larry, the, the only thing that occurs to me, and then we'll get off the subject, because uh, I don't want to sound like Mike Wallace, the prosecutor for the world, but it seems to me that it might have crossed your mind, or might still cross your mind, to say, hey, I'm making a lot of money now. Let me start to buy and pay some of those people some of the money that I left Okay, on. you got a legal problem with that. I sat down my lawyer and said, I'd like to do that. And he says, when we have $500,000 in the bank, we will. Reason. Once you pay one, you open up the bankruptcy. The reason they want you to stay in bankruptcy when you're bankrupt is so that you can't show favorites. And therefore, if I say, well, I owe Joe Abril $10, so I'm going to pay you the $10, right. every bill's open. Why well, subject myself to that? I would tell you honestly, if I had $500,000 put away, I'd pay everything. Because I'm not, it doesn't rule my life anymore. Right. Right. So 
why don't we all hope to get it? I have five hundred thousand. <laughs> Let's hope for Larry's big success. <laughs> Everybody, right? Root me, for it. That's I'll right. forward the bills to Larry. <laughs> well, have you dreaded coming here, afraid that you might meet one of those people that's on that list that you owed and, and is going to embarrass you in front of other people? I mean, have you been a little, you know, a little gun shy this weekend here in Miami? With public knowledge, you were going to come here ahead of time. Mm. No. Uh, maybe five years ago, I would have been if circumstances were different. I'm. I've changed a lot, and uh, I'll confront that if it happens. I'm not afraid of it. You still gamble? Are you interested? No. In, don't, I was don't. telling someone today, they said, uh, an old uh, friend of mine said, I asked him if he still goes to the racetrack, and he said he does. I haven't been to track in 18 months. I used to go to track so much. Yeah. I never gambled on anything else. I never understood. I never bet a football game, never bet a baseball game, never knew a bookmaker. I ne and I know baseball and football, and didn't know horse racing. I think that was an ego trip I was on. I have no desire to go. It's been 18 months since I've been in a racetrack, and it's not. This is not a thing like sending Bob Wolf money, yeah. because I could take fifty dollars sure. and go to a racetrack. Right. No, I don't feel any desire at all. Another thing, someone suggested that it might be area, that what happened to me might not have happened if I lived in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't know that that's true. You mentioned ego trip. You think uh, you've got more reason to have an ego uh, uh, now than then. Thing now than then. Yeah. Well, that's the funny thing about ego. Um, I have nowhere near what I had then. Really? Oh. I was on such an ego trip in this town. Why? What, well, I'll tell you why. This is a, Miami's a very strange town. It may not be now, but when I broke in here in the late 50s and early 60s, this is historically a low-paying city. Okay, so this is a market where people walked out. People used to see me and say, boy, you're on News Weekend, and you're on the radio every night, and you got a column in the Herald. That's right. I pulled all three jobs in 1968 and made $61,000. If I had those three jobs in New York City, I would have made $800,000 a year. Right. All right, so we start that with the fact that this is also a personality town, and I got carried away, man. If the, I had to have the Cadillac, and I had to look good, and I had to tip good, and I had to loan money, because that's good, too, to help people. Yeah, of course. All of it a flash. And now I don't need to do that, uh, because I'm well within myself. Uh, I could say something now I couldn't have said 10 years ago. Whatever success I've gotten, I deserve, because I'm good at what I do. I'm damn good at what I do. And the person that does that is also good at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I don't have the ego trip. And obviously we haven't talked about your radio show because uh, tonight they can turn on their radios and listen to they you listen. next week or whatever and, and hear you and see how you're doing. Anything you want to say to the folks in Miami? A lot of people watching right now. Maybe you'll never see in person. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot of wonderful years here. And I, uh, I loved working here. I'm sorry for a lot of things I did and a lot of things I'm very proud of. I'm proud of, uh, I don't want to make a speech, I'm proud of the charitable events and the speeches and the it's still involvement home. in the community. It's still home for you. Yeah, it's still home. Okay. Larry King, welcome home. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. We'll be right back. You might not think trying to sell hot dogs would get very complicated. I don't think. Well, wait. The code of the city of Miami has something to say about that. Here's Ed O'Dell to tell us about what some are calling already the hot dog wars. You wanted to go, Joe? This is Lou. He argues that Lou is a fine name, so why do you need my last? Okay, Lou, it's your name. Be selfish. Lou owns the Sabret hot dog wagon in front of the Metro Justice Building. You may have noticed the proliferation of these shiny carts around South Florida recently. Hot dog wagons are a part of one of the fastest growing businesses in the state today, street vending. And as fast as the business grows, so grow problems with the law and competition. I had a lot of competition, if that's what you meant. Well, yeah, yeah. A, lot, a lot of competition. There are laws that I have to obey. Uh, I was chased, but I came back. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, I don't, yeah, there were people that tried to run me off. There are still people that tried to run me off, trying to grab the spot that I'm on, you know. Money people, they want the, the area. But the city or the county or anybody like that's never bothered you? No, the city or the county, they never bother me, you know. I don't have problems with them. Lou may not have a problem right now with city or county governments, but other street vendors do. Hot dog vendors or vendors operating from push carts and trucks can operate citywide, 
so long as they do it in the public right-of-way, not on private property. The reason why city and county officials don't want pushcart vendors on private property is because officials want the vendors to be rovers. Make your sale and move on is the reading of the ordinance, but pushcart vendors are sandwiched between local codes and state regulations. The state of Florida requires that the pushcarts be equipped with a container for hot and cold water, a container for wastewater, a single compartment sink, and a trash can. Add to that whatever equipment the vendor needs to cook, serve, and garnish the dogs, and frankly speaking, he ends up with a cumbersome wagon that only a car can move. So vendors try to find one spot to plant their wheels. For that, some have been arrested and many ticketed. Currently, there is a restraining order against citing the vendors until the constitutionality of the ordinance is argued in court next week. However, one thing no one is arguing against is the health requirements for these hot dog vendors. We welcome all regulations dealing with food, particularly what's happening today. Howard Horowitz is one of four owners of the Florida franchise for Sabret Hot Dogs. Just how fast is this business growing? Less than a year ago, with only one wagon on the streets, the franchise sold about 150 hot dogs a day. Today, there are 300 wagons around the state, and the home office here in Miami sells 20,000 hot dogs each day. And we go around occasionally, all the, all the Sabret people and uh, my partners, and we will examine these carts. We'll go by, buy a hot dog, and make sure that uh, they're keeping the uh, hot dogs in a clean manner, and uh, all the food products they're selling are, are properly covered and maintained. Horowitz added that it costs about $3,500 to get started in the hot dog vending business, and much of that money goes towards purchasing license, especially the county health department's certification. We watched as Amare de la Esparella, a county health inspector checked on this wagon under the Hebrew National umbrella. Todavía no está caliente porque la acaba de encender, pero trate de tenerla todo el tiempo encendida. Okay. The only violation I found was the he ha, she has no hot water available. The health inspector went on to say that the law requires hot water because the vendor may need to wash her hands or any utensil that may get soiled. By the way, this vendor, Sylvia Herrera, told me that she makes about $250 a week at this location, which is just around the corner from our friend Jess Lou at the Civic Center. Sylvia also said they have a lot of regular customers like the man there in the coral-colored shirt. Do you wonder how safe these wagons are? That man is a health department employee. But how do you know when the food from one of these carts is safe? Well, the best way to be sure is to check for the Dade County Health Department sticker. Ed Sties, environmental health supervisor with Dade County, says all food wagons with the health department sticker are checked at least four times a year. If there was some kind of violation uh, that would cause injury to a person by eating that food, cause them to get sick, we're looking to eliminate this possibility. But this man is a part of a group selling foodstuffs on the streets of Dade County that is not sanctioned by the health department at this intersection at Northwest 27th Avenue and 20th Street. And here on Coral Way, we found a total of 10 individuals who proved to be Mariel refugees selling onions, limes, bananas, peeled oranges, and coconuts to passers-by. Is it safe for you to buy and consume these items? Again, Ed Sties. When we talk about food, for example, vegetables, uh, this is a product that is not really uh, dangerous if it's not kept properly refrigerated, and therefore uh, we do not get ourselves involved into it at this point. Probably a good idea to see if you can find a health department sticker on your favorite street vendor, but if you don't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not good, but it's better if you see it. Next week, we are going to show you why the stray animals in Dade County are becoming a serious health hazard, and a man who will tell us about perhaps America's finest public figure who, although dead over 20 years, is causing rethinking in Washington today. That's Montage for this week. I'm Joe Abril. Wow, wow, wow.